High school sports, we've got it covered. Overtime starts now. Hello and welcome to Overtime. I'm Drew Collins. And I'm Scott Lover. Tonight, Harlem against Guilford and Hanani at Freeport top our Nick 10 coverage. Tim Bailey will join us for a conversation about those games. And then UIC, we've got a great game in Stockton between the Blackhawks and Eastland Pearl City. We'll also head to Duran for Dupec against Galena. And in our Spotlight Feature story, I'll sit down with one of the most exciting players in Nick 10 history, and certainly in Harlem history, Jamani Muhammad. When we start in the Big Northern Conference with two teams that have quick strike offenses, Rockford Lutheran and Dixon. The Crusaders and the Dukes have lots of playmakers. That's why Dixon opened the season with four straight wins. The Crusaders opened with three wins in their first four games. It's the Gillies heating and air conditioning game of the week. Let's go to Dixon. Roll the tape on Purple Rain by Prince here for the intro. First drive of the game and the Dukes give it to Landon Kanigi and he takes it to the crib. Dukes lead 7-0. My parents taught me if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that is what Luke and the Dukes do here. Back to back like 2015 Drake, Luke was unstoppable tonight. But it's time for the Crusaders to answer. They run play action, make a man miss, that man is here, that man is me here on this play, but we find him in the end zone. That's David Ballard for the score. Dixon defense leads to this goal line tutty. That's big old 88 Devon Wallace to punch it in. Crusaders are now trailing 28 to seven in the second. They run this jet pass to the fastest man on the field. David Ballard takes this one all the way to the end zone, but the Dukes didn't allow the Crusaders to score a single point in the second half. The Dukes win 56-13. Our next big Northern game is in Byron. The undefeated Tigers hosted Oregon. The Hawks run a two-game winning streak. First drive for the Tigers, Andrew Talbert airing it out. Brayden Knoll, oh, that was a perfect pass. The first score of the game, a beauty for the Tigers. Byron's defense making plays too. Hunter Bartell getting dropped behind the line of scrimmage for the loss by three or four orange jerseys. Now, weird play here. Talbert faking everybody out on the QB keeper, including the refs who Apparently, they blew the play dead after seeing the running back tackle. They didn't know Talbert had the ball, so no TD. Kate McGowan then getting the bulk of the load after the confusion, plowing ahead to move the chains. And then we're in the second quarter. It's Braden Ole again, bringing it on home, standing for the touchdown. Byron defeated Oregon 49-7. At Stillman Valley, the Cardinals hosted North Boone. Boys are getting ready there. Second quarter. Cardinals with it. The give is to Jackson Barrett, and he fights and pushes his way over the goal line for a Stillman touchdown. North Boone possession. They're trying to punt, but it's mishandled by Mason Smith, and Stillman gets it back and in great field possession. But North Boone's defense stands tall as they force an incompletion on fourth down. That was a great stand there. The Vikings had some injury troubles this season. Their starting quarterback going down in week one. Braden Slater was starting in this one, and his pass gets deflected and picked off by Jackson Musial, which would set them up deep late in the half. Jackson Barrett going to get the ball again, and he plows into the end zone for another Stillman Valley touchdown. It's hard to stop that at the goal line. Stillman Valley takes this one 48-7. There was one other big Northern game tonight. Genoa Kingston beat Winnebago 41-0. We have NUIC action coming up later in our Spotlight Story on Jamani Muhammad. But next, we turn the page to the Nick 10 and a key game at Guilford between the Vikings and the Harlem Huskies. You're watching Overtime. Hananiga fumbled when it came to filing the proper paperwork for a transfer player. This cost Indians a share of first place in the Nick 10. It also pushed Harlem into a tie for first place with Belvedere North. Hananiga had to forfeit its Week 3 win at Harlem. Hananiga did not have to forfeit, though, its two wins the first two weeks of the season because the IHSA didn't believe the paper, the player rather in question significantly impacted Hananiga's opening two wins like he did in the win over Harlem. That player is now eligible to play again. He never did anything wrong. The paperwork mix-up was an oversight on the part of Hananiga's administration. So that brings us to Harlem's game tonight at Guilford. The Huskies trying to improve the 5-0. and Guilford needed a win to go to 3-2. and Guilford is slightly to halftime, but then all Huskies. Jamani Muhammad with that carry, same drive. Muhammad on the counter play, going hard up the middle there. Now down near the goal line, why not give it to Muhammad again? He fights for the TD. He's strong for a small guy. He's in there. Antonio Paul, where are you? Time for a little end zone celebration choreographed there by the big fella. 
Harlem's defense turning it up now. Ahmad Hurd, number 90, gets in there to sack Grayson Weber. That's in the third quarter. Back to the Huskies offense and back to Muhammad. He will get the edge here. And when he does, he's gone. That TD made it 23 to 13 Huskies. Weber now rolling out, but Isaiah Dosi Coleman, number 70, runs him down from behind from the sack. Weber gonna get sacked again. Again, it's Ahmad Hurd who gets to him. Defense looking good for Harlem as the Huskies roll in the second half and win it 30 to 13. And Nick 10 analyst Tim Bailey joins us now with some thoughts on this game once again. Tim, Tim, I've seen Harlem three times now. Tonight was by far the best that I've seen them look. Where have they improved now here in week five? I think they've improved in really all facets. You know, the passing game, the run game, and also, too, in special teams. Um, you know, what they did tonight on offense is nothing short of phenomenal. Um, they had great blocking up front, um, you know, a, a few times, particularly in the, in, the, in, the third, in the third quarter. They had really good blocking in the fourth quarter as well. But, you know, what they were able to establish was they were able to establish a run early. They actually threw some passing, passing plays in there. They were really, um, really sound on actually in the passing game and in the run game. So that's what they did really well tonight. We don't have the final stats on Jamani Muhammad, but he had a big night, especially in that third quarter. What did they do in that second half differently? Well, they came, they just made their adjustments at halftime. I mean, you know, Harlem's a good team. You know, good teams, this is what they do. They make their adjustments at halftime and they come out and you see things come to fruition. So, you know, basically they just, you know, they just came out and just really executed. You know, they out executed um, Guilford on both sides of the ball tonight. And that's why they came out with the big win tonight. All right, Harlem now 5-0 and with the help of that four-foot win. Uh, Harlem only went away now from clinching a playoff yeah. berth already. Guilford, on the other hand, they're 2-3 and three with yeah. this loss, and uh, they're really going to have to battle to make it to the playoffs. What is, what's missing from this Guilford team, Tim? You know, if you go back and you look at the game, you, you see the first half. I mean, they, were, they, they had control of the game. I mean, they were, they were up 13-9 to nine at halftime, you know, and they kind of went away from the run in the second half. You didn't see... Uh, Primus, and then you didn't see the young, other young man, Porter, really getting the ball and really picking up first downs for, for Guilford. Guilford kind of like, some, so to speak, relied really on the pass very heavily in the second half. We talked back in week one about the play of the sophomore quarterback, Grayson Weber. Is he making any strides right now? He's, he's making strides. I, I see it. You know, he, he's a different kid from week one to where we are now in week four. Um, you know, he's going to really be a treat, treat to watch. You know, he was just really under a lot of, you know, immense duress tonight. I mean, he was, he was on the run a lot. You know, he, he, I mean, he had linemen were in his face. And he just didn't really have enough time to really set his feet and throw the ball. If you saw the game tonight, what he was doing a lot back there, he was actually having to get out of the pocket and actually roll out and throw on the run. And those are some tough passes. Did he make tough passes? Yeah, he made tough passes. But also, too, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of passes that he would actually take back tonight if he could. All right, let's turn our attention now to Hananiga. The Indians played at Freeport tonight. The Pretzels came in confident, running a two-game winning streak. Fourth and inches for Hano and Cooper Hathaway. He's going to get started after the captains meet here at half field. Here it is. And the big play becomes a turnover on downs. Next possession. Dominic Kelly is going to get the ball here. And he's going to drop back. He runs one way, then reverses his direction finds his blockers, follows them, weaving through these pretzel defenders, and finds his way for this incredible 51-yard score. Kelly rushed for 107 total yards tonight. He, he just was on a mission tonight. Pretzel's ball now. We're gonna have Peyton Woker under center. He sets his feet. His pass is intercepted by Brody Sedil. The pick, though, didn't count because of a roughing the passer penalty. Now Indians' Kurt Smith finds some running room, then darts his way to the end zone from 27 yards, just like that jersey number. Like I said in the past, this kid is the real deal. Hananiga wins 35-0. They might have had a little bit of chip on their, or a little bit of chip on their shoulder after that drama they endured last week. So kind of, how do you see them bouncing back this week? I think they did a good job bouncing back. I mean, you know, you know, things happened over there. You know, last week. Uh, they were able to get a, get their hands around things and just really move forward. So, you know, what they did tonight, I'm really not surprised. Um, you know, it was just really good to see them really get back on track. The kids get focused, get back to football and winning games. Going back to your playing days, uh, there wasn't often that Boylan uh, faced adversity because yeah. you guys had yes. some dynamite teams in your day. But when you guys did face adversity, what, what lessons did you learn from the coaches back then about how you deal with it, uh, the way Hananiga is trying to do it now? Well, you know, you just, you just, you know, your coaches tell you, hey, guys, you know, this is what we're going through. You know, we're going to get through it as a family, as a team, as a community. 
Um, and, and you just you just you just hope the guys actually adhere to that. And actually they go out and they, you know, they get back to school and focus on, you know, the grades. And then they come back to the to the sports and to the gridiron. And then they focus on just getting back on that on that winning track, so to speak, that they're on already. And sometimes it's good for a team, too, because they circle the wagons yep. and it brings them closer together yeah, right, and yeah. makes them stronger. Yeah. So and that's I, and why. I, and I, I think I think Hananigas, they're, they're, they're a little sour, you know, about, you know, about what had happened, you mm -hmm. know. But, you know, they, they're, I think they're going to use this as, as fuel uh, going forward. I think, you know, we're going to see Hananiga, you know, you know, I know they have the big showdown against Belvedere North coming up. But, you know, Hananiga mm -hmm. is going to continue to be Hananiga as they always have. Right. Well, they went out and played football tonight. Hey, let's check out another Nick 10 game. East taking on Auburn at Wyeth State. And let's ice in on number 45. He is East linebacker Corbin Hayda, one of the better linebackers in the conference. My spider sense is telling me he's going to make a big play. But no, it's Demarius Creighton who picks off the pass and takes it back for a pick six. East up 8 nothing, second quarter. My spider senses were right though about Hayda. They were just off by a series because in the next series, Hayda does get the pick six. The E-Rabs have a little reunion in the end zone after that. They were having fun all night. It was 19 to nothing. East conversion, Twain Phillips throwing the ball to Creighton. I mean, we wouldn't see that in years past from the E-Rabs. They would just pound it in. Next play now, it is Chris Tolliver on the run. Get a nice block there, and he's out of bounds after a big gain. And then the e rabs again going to the air. It's Phillips to Tyshawn Witte. Big play there. That would lead to an East touchdown. Good night for the e rabs They won it big, 38-6. Also in the Nick 10, Boylan beat Belvedere 57-21. The offense gets going for the Titans. The most they had scored in a game before tonight was 25 points. And Belvedere North won 47-8 over Jefferson. The Blue Thunder keep rolling at 5-0. Let's take a look at our over-under question this week. How many Nick 10 running backs will finish the regular season with 1,000 yards rushing? Let's look at the top rushers coming into tonight. This does not include tonight's numbers, which are not in yet. Through four games, we had LaShawn Gathright of Jefferson with 592 yards, Shamani Muhammad with 493, Cam Verner of Freeport with 488, Hanos Kirk Smith at 480 and East, Tyshawn Whitty at 344. Again, the over-under set at 3.5. Tim? You going over that or under <laughs> that, huh? You know, I, I think I'm going to go under. Uh, I, th I think we're going to see three of those those guys up there, um, you know, go over, you know, rush for 1,000 yards this year. 1,000 yards to rush for in, in only nine weeks, that, that's that's yeah. tough. Mm -hmm. You know, um, been there, done that. It's tough to, to be able to eclipse that 1,000 yards for the year. But I, I'm going to go with three. Drew? I got the over. There's no reason all five of these kids right here on this screen can't do it. I, I have high hopes in all of them. I think they can get it done. Okay, I'm going with the under two. Gathright and Muhammad, if they stay healthy, are locks because they're workhorses who their teams depend on. Werner is two, so I could see him. Kurt Smith, on the other hand, I mean, with Hananiga blowing out teams and so many good running backs, he may not get enough touches to make it to that 1,000 yard. The, the kids <clears throat> at Belvedere North, though, <clears throat> Roman and Booker, are, oh, yeah. they're good enough yeah. to rush for 1,000, but they're never going to get enough touches because no, they got no. so many running yeah. backs they rotate mm -hmm. in and out of there. Folks, if you want more from Tim on Nick Tin football, check out the Bailey Pod. You can find it on YouTube. His guest this week is Belvedere North's player, Eric Roman. All right, thanks, Tim. We will Appreciate talk again next week. Thanks, guys. Appreciate we it. We are back to the highlights next in the NUIC big games at Pecatonica and at Stockton. We turn our attention now to the NUIC. It's Lena Winslow and Dupec setting the pace. Their showdown in Lena is next Friday night. Lena Winslow had tonight off because Mineral Point, Wisconsin, canceled their non-conference game with them. So the Panthers were going to next week undefeated. The Rivermen were trying to do the same as they took the field tonight in Duran. They hosted Galena. Pirates not bad coming in with an overall record of 3-1. and one. But the Rivermen, you knew uh, they were going to protect their home turf, especially on homecoming. Duran. Galena getting off to a great start though. Look at this Pirates first play from scrimmage. Miles Schumacher bouncing outside. Riverman trying to chase him down. He cuts back. He's still going. He's got a 55 yard run to the seven. Next play. Quarterback Roman Romer keeps it and he's in there for the touchdown. Six to nothing Pirates. The Riverman though tighten things up after that. QB Cooper Hoffman showing off those quick feet. He's got a big run down to the Galena 35-yard line. Then Hoffman will go to the air. Jackson Diedrich, number seven, has it. That keeps the drive going. 
Hoffman then will hand it off to Lucas Rossau. And Lucas goes in for the touchdown. Dupac rolls to the big win, 61 to 13. Two of the most improved teams in the NUIC this season are Eastland, Pearl City, and Stockton. And I'm not surprised. EPC, they look real good when I was at the preseason practice. And Stockton's new weight program that they started a couple years ago has really paid off. These two teams play physical football, so we expected a physical battle tonight when they met in Stockton. Rianne Weil made the trip. She joins us with the story of this one. Hi, Rianne. Hey guys, Eastland Pearl City came into this game with a record of 3-1. The Wildcats' only loss was to Dupec. Stockton came in at 2-2, two two, but the Blackhawks' two losses were to Dupec and Lena Winslow. And the Blackhawks were right in both of those games. Stockton was fired up for this home game, but the Wildcats did come ready to play in this one. On just the second play of the game, EPC quarterback Adam Alwender hands it off to Draven Zier, who takes it from nearly their own 20-yard line and flies past the defense to give the Wildcats an early lead. Now this would be a name we hear a lot throughout the game as he is one of their top performers. Zier makes it 8-0 here with 11.45 to go in the first. Stockton fighting back, but it's Zier once again who takes down Carter Blair of the Blackhawks. But a defensive play now for the Blackhawks as Bryce Group takes with the big takedown on EPC's Jackson Kempel. But Zier pushes himself through and gets one, another one on the board here, giving EPC a lead of 14-0 before the second quarter right in the sand. And the Wildcats aren't done yet. Kempel takes this one into the end zone to make for a 20 to nothing lead before the end of the second quarter. Little helmet tap here with his teammates. Stockton was held scoreless in the first half thanks to big plays like this made by Will Burton. Your final in Stockton, EPC takes it 34 to eight. Now after those first few touchdowns, I have to say that the duo of Allwender and Zier is pretty dangerous. I'm sure we'll be hearing more of them the rest of this season. Guys, back to you. Thanks, Rianne. Here are a couple more scores in the NUIC. Fulton tops Dakota 45-6. Morrison beat Forreston 28-12. In other area games, Rochelle beat LaSalle, Peru 48-20. Big one for the Hubs. Sycamore all over Ottawa 63-0. Naqua Valley defeated DeKalb 28-12. And Marengo all over Plano 42-0. In eight-man football, South Beloit beat AFC 35-14. River Ridge won 22-12 over Hiawatha. Polo beat Olden Hebron 54-6. And Milledgeville topped West Carroll 44 to nothing. Let's take another brief timeout. When we come back, we'll have our weekly spotlight feature story. We'll get to know the leader of Harlem's pack of Huskies, electric running back Jamani Muhammad. Harlem senior running back Jamani Muhammad will go down as one of the most dynamic playmakers in Nick 10 history. He made a big splash two years ago as a sophomore, and he's had opposing defenses on alert ever since. Tonight, we focus on Muhammad and our spotlight story brought to you by Benchmark Exteriors. Catch him if you can. Jamani Muhammad isn't one of the biggest guys you'll ever see on a football field, but he's certainly one of the most elusive and one of the most dazzling offensive weapons that the Nick 10 has ever seen. What makes you a great running back? Uh, my speed, my vision, and my explosiveness. Let's also add in his work ethic. Muhammad spends a lot of time on his own conditioning, working on his footwork, his quickness, his cutting ability. He spent several sessions over the summer working with Tim Bailey at Mercy Health's top performers, pushing himself. I gain speed, I gain strength, um, I gain more confidence in my game. The last few summers, Muhammad has traveled around the Midwest attending camps at college campuses, including Ohio State and Notre Dame. It just makes you want to play up to that high level being around all those such like good coaches, players, and that makes you want to compete when you're at this at those camps. Muhammad also spends a lot of time watching video. I spend a lot of time uh, studying film, studying my opponent, and even studying my game and what I could do better. With all the work Muhammad puts in, it's no surprise what he's achieved at Harlem. His sophomore year, he rushed for almost 1,600 yards. He became the first sophomore to lead the Nick 10 in rushing. Last year, he rushed for almost 1,300 yards, and now he has a shot to become the first player in Nick 10 history to have three 1,000-yard seasons. Coming into this weekend, he was only 248 yards away from surpassing Javius Catlin as the conference's all-time rushing leader. Looking back, did he imagine he could accomplish so much? I didn't really think about it too much, but I knew I, I had the confidence in myself to come out here and be successful in the field. 
This year, Muhammad has packed 15 more pounds of muscle on his 5'7 frame. That's enabled him to be effective running between the tackles as well as attacking the edges. If there's one place in growth, it's uh, his ability to run in the, into the middle. Um, he's become a really physical kid. Despite his small stature, he really brings it. He's probably one of our heaviest hitters. You know, obviously Muhammad is our, the number one guy that we have to be aware of where he's at on the field at all times. Anytime you have an athlete like that, it's pretty special. This season in week two against Auburn, Muhammad rushed for 190 yards and five touchdowns. In week four against Jefferson, he rushed for 135 yards and three touchdowns, including the game winner with 35 seconds to play. Muhammad's achievements have come despite defense is always keen on stopping him. Uh, it's not really frustrating, it's really uh, respectful because that means like they respect my game and uh, so it means a lot to me that they respect me as a player. For Muhammad, the only thing that tops that feeling of conference-wide respect is the feeling he gets seeing his father Steven and mother Sonia get excited whenever he makes a big play. Brings a smile to your face. They've been so great to me, uh, taking me places, practice, camps. I can't thank them enough for what they've done for me so far. And I enjoy watching Jamani's parents get excited too. So what's next for Jamani after he graduates from Harlem next spring? Uh, he definitely wants to play college ball. He has several yeah. D2 schools in Minnesota that are very interested, including Winona State, Minnesota State, and the University of Minnesota Duluth. We'll be back after one final timeout. Hey, join us again next Friday night for overtime. We'll be on a little later after the Michigan State-Oregon College game on Fox. That starts at 8 o'clock, so we're looking at about an 11.30 start time for us. We'll also have overtime on our website and YouTube channel for viewing throughout the weekend. For another look at this entire show and for scores and highlights of individual games, go to mystateline.com anytime. That does it for this episode. Thanks for joining us. Good night and enjoy your weekend.